Last week, the title of the class, and you've probably noticed this, was Orthodox Irrationalism and Pietism. Because I had stuff having to do with Catholicism, and counter I had other stuff that I hadn't dealt with yet. I dealt with those first, and, then, and I just barely hit the high points for Orthodoxy, Rationalism, and Pietism. As I thought about it, I realized we need to spend more time with that. So today, we're starting out, even though the class today is called Beyond Christendom, we're going to start out with Orthodoxy, Rationalism, and Pietism. We're also going to look at some of the other philosophical, major philosophical uh, issues and philosophers that affected the understanding of Christianity and the, the way that society um, participates in and how we believe Christianity. Um, and then I'm going to deal a little bit beyond Christendom with especially regard to some of the other movements that came along and uh, some of the movements especially that greatly influenced the New World. Then next week in the first hour I will deal with uh, materialism in the modern times and a little bit more of the beyond Christendom and only in one hour because you have tests to take the second hour and far be it from me to take any time away from that. Okay? So we will deal with that. So today I want to start out talking about uh, Protestant Orthodoxy and Lutheran Orthodoxy. Now first let me say, and I had this question uh, before, the word Orthodoxy is Greek, it means literally right belief. And so Orthodoxy means getting it right. The only problem is different people think getting it right is different things. So throughout the, the time after the Reformers, starting in the generation after the Reformers, by that I mean the people who came after Luther, and Zwingli, and Calvin, and these guys, um, we have a period which is called the period of Protestant Orthodoxy, where various of the followers of Luther, Calvin, and others developed systems in which they tried to expound the beliefs of their founders, like Lutherans who came after Luther tried to establish uh, or expound on what Luther had said in order to develop much more comprehensive theologies. John Calvin was the only one of the re reformers that really did much theological work in terms of writing it down. Calvin's Institutes is still one of the great works of Christian, you know, Christian literature. But Luther did not have a magnum opus, a big book, literally what that means, where he wrote down all of his theology. In fact, uh, Luther, by his own admission later in his life, there were some big gaps in his theology. Luther, because he was brought to his, uh, to his Christian faith, uh, in terms of his satisfaction of the Christian faith, he'd been a monk and everything else, but he really wasn't happy, he didn't feel like he was saved, so much of his energy and effort had come through trying to understand salvation. How, am I, how can I be sure I'm saved? That justification, that is the process of being saved, the justification being the theological word, was so much his orientation that Luther wrote virtually nothing about sanctification, holiness. Meaning his focus was, what's the process of salvation, how do we receive it, you know, etc. He did not develop the idea of what do we do with it then, nearly as much as the people who came after him. Not to say he completely disregarded it, but he, that wasn't his focus. Others had a different approach to that. Okay? Calvin, for instance, had a much more balanced approach because he wrote a systematic theology, the Institutes of the Christian Faith, which dealt with sanctification much more so. So, now I want to start out talking about how Protestant Orthodoxy, the generation after the Reformers, dealt with defining and articulating theologies consistent with what they thought their founders had said. Does that make sense? All right. Quick question. Mark. Yes. Could you repeat again what your definition of orthodoxy is? It literally means right belief. Right. And so the Lutheran theologians who came after Luther, they defined orthodoxy in terms of this is the right belief. And the Calvinists are all wrong and going to hell, for instance. <laughs> well, the Calvinists said this is right belief. And those Lutherans just don't get it. All right? So orthodoxy means right belief. Um, and the, the, that's the reason there is a, um, you know, an Eastern Orthodox church. That very name means they believe they got it right, whereas the Roman Catholics had it wrong. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean the word orthodoxy itself is a bad idea, because we believe there is an orthodoxy. In fact, the right definition for orthodoxy, as far as I'm concerned, is what C.S. Lewis called mere Christianity. That is, the basic beliefs that virtually all Christians have held at virtually all times. Not the, and I'm going to mention a word here in a minute, and in fact, it's up here, adiaphora. Not the, the sort of gray area or the, the uh, extra beliefs, like do you sprinkle or dunk? 
That's an idiot. Okay, that, and you know, some Baptists would disagree with me, but that's not an issue of whether or not you're saved. Okay? So, let's talk about that. After Luther's death, the, every one of the major reformers had a successor, somebody who took up the responsibility. In most cases, they were appointed or selected by the reformers before their death. Luther's um, successor was a man named Philip Melanchthon. Melanchthon was primarily the person responsible for writing the Confession of Augsburg, for instance, which is the, you know, the primary statement of faith of the Lutheran Church, and he was greatly trusted by Luther. But in many ways, Melanchthon differed with Luther. And Melanchthon was a very easygoing guy. He didn't like conflict. He didn't like conflict with Luther, who loved conflict. You know, <laughs> Luther could get into a brawl, a verbal brawl over something. He had a good day. Melanchthon was much more congenial. For instance, Luther uh, really rejected and had trouble with and argued against people like Erasmus, who was a humanist Christian. And Melanchthon, even though Luther really didn't like Erasmus and thought that he was very much going in the wrong direction, Melanchthon maintained a good relationship with him. He, Erasmus was highly respected by people on all sides, and Melanchthon kept a good relationship. Luther didn't like him. Luther also did not believe in using rationality as an aspect of our Christian faith, meaning you know, to, to think that, that we have to take kind of a philosophical, rational approach. In fact, Luther went so far as to say that unless you kill rationality, theology can't really exist. <laughs> Melanchthon didn't agree with that, you know, um, because Luther was focused on faith. You know, as in terms of saving faith, again, back to that justification issue. It's not that he wasn't a thinker, it wasn't smart, or any of that. It's just he had very strong feelings about that. Melanchthon actually had some kind of humanist, um, uh, rationalist kind of kind of inclinations. He, like, he believed that God gave us logic and reason, and we needed to apply it to theology as well as everything else. Okay? So, after Luther's death, Melanchthon took his place as the main interpreter of Luther's theology, but some of the more conservative Lutherans who came after thought that Melanchthon, or felt that Melanchthon was too influenced by humanism, by Erasmus and others. And that, Luke, that Melanchthon was too willing to, when pressured, to concede points that he thought was not critical to faith. For instance, um, in the whole, this was still the time when Lutheranism was being threatened. Um, there was a, um, the Roman, the Holy Roman Emperor, encouraged what he called, uh, he encouraged Lutherans to sign what's called the Augsburg Interim. And it was an effort to try to get the Lutherans to compromise with Catholics. It was an effort to try to come up with one document that everybody would agree to to keep them from fighting. Well, there were aspects of the, of the Augsburg Interim that um, the, the strict Lutherans really disagreed with. Well, Melanchthon disagreed with part of them too. And he came back and said, there's certain points here we can't accept, and they changed those. There were other points in the interim that Melanchthon thought, okay, those aren't critical to our faith. They're not critical to salvation or whatever. They are what is called adiaphora, the gray areas. Okay, that's the word that means the, the sort of in-between areas, adiaphora. It's, again, it's like, do you have to be baptized to be saved? I'm, you know, it's, it's, how you baptize people is not a critical aspect of, what, of Christianity. It's not part of mere Christianity. Well, Melanchthon felt like, eventually, he signed the, the, um, the modified version of the Augsburg um, Interim, which was called the Leipzig Interim, because they did modify it, because he wouldn't buy everything. He signed it, and was just lambasted by all the strict Lutherans who said, you know, Marty is rolling over in his grave because you signed that. At that point, they developed two very distinct, different camps, if you will. The ones who were on Melanchthon's side, who were a little more generous, a little more liberal, and were not ready to cast John Calvin into hell, were called the Philippists, after Philip Melanchthon. The others were just called the strict Lutherans. Okay? So the strict Lutherans accused the Philippists, those that supported Melanchthon, of being Calvinists, which Luther did not have a problem with Calvin. They disagreed, particularly on the presence of Christ in, in communion. That was one of the points of disagreement. But as I've said before, when, when Calvin's Institutes first came out and Luther read it, he really liked it. So they didn't agree on everything, but they didn't have as much trouble with each other. The successors to Luther thought Calvin was, you know, the, the, the demon of, from hell kind of thing, and that he was completely wrong, and that Philip Melanchthon was on his side. And so in response to that, they started developing what was called Lutheran Orthodoxy, or in some cases it's referred to as Lutheran Scholasticism. Catholic scholasticism, which had been back in the 13th, 12th and 13th centuries, 
the high point of which was Thomas Aquinas, okay, St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, it, it came out of the schools, which is why it's called scholasticism, and it was a very academic, very expansive definition. I mean, this is where the great systematic theologies, you know, the 20-volume kinds of things came out of. Um, and as I've said before, they dealt with issues like how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. That was a real scholastic argument. Okay? And the Lutheran scholasticism sort of followed that direction, not in terms of the angels on the head of a pin necessarily. I don't know if they got into that or not. But they developed these massive systems of philosophy, of theology, that were oriented toward trying to explain or expound on or develop what Luther said. And I've got a note here. Unlike Luther, or Calvin, or others, the, the Lutheran scholastics were not focused on expounding the truth of Scripture. They were focused on expounding what they thought was the truth of Luther and defending him as opposed to Calvin or Zwingli or somebody else. In fact, one of the first things they did was they took Zwingli and Calvin and everybody else and lumped them all together and rejected the whole lot because they weren't Luther. Okay. Now, don't think I'm picking on Lutherans, Harringtons, <laughs> because you know this, this isn't what Luther did or said, and they weren't the only ones to do this, as you'll find out in just a moment. But what this did was it led to, because it was a sort of defensive effort against somebody else, it led to this kind of entrenched, dogmatic, rigid view of Christian theology, which they said, we're right and everybody else is wrong. That's why it's called Lutheran orthodoxy, right belief, as opposed to everybody else's wrong beliefs, especially all those Calvinists and everybody, okay? Um, and they ended up winning in terms of becoming the dominant Lutheran theology. The interesting thing was that in their enthusiasm for developing these post-Luther, Lutheran theologies, they ended up saying, saying some things which, to us, as we look at it now, we go, are you not paying attention to yourself here? For instance, one of the things the Catholic Church had said was that the Latin Vulgate, that is the Latin translation of the Bible, was divinely inspired. The Council of Trent in the Catholic Reformation had said the Latin Vulgate, which was translated by Jerome, you know, in the 4th century, that, um, that 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 is officially inspired by God, and so therefore that's all we need. You don't need to go back to the Hebrew and Greek. Well, that's something the Protestants absolutely didn't agree with. Luther completely didn't agree with that. And yet, the Lutheran scholastics, the Lutheran Orthodox theologians, they came along and said that the Holy Spirit had inspired the Jewish scholars who added the vowel points to the original Hebrew text. The Masoretic text, which came after the time of Jesus, where they took the original Hebrew, Hebrew, as you know, do, doesn't have any vowels. It's all consonant, consonants. Most ancient languages had no vowels in the written version because vowels are breathing sounds. It's, it, they tell you how to pronounce it, but you don't need it to be able to read them. Don't, don't need them to be able to read the language. Well, the Masoretes, up until the 900s, you know, for over hundreds of years, they worked on these texts and they added these vowel points. Well, the Lutheran scholastics argued that those vowel points were divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit. And people said, how can you believe that? And yet, the, the very idea that the Latin Vulgate might have been inspired by the Holy Spirit throws you guys into conniption fits. You know, there was not a logic to some of that. Okay. Now, lest you believe that I'm picking on Lutherans, let's talk about Reformed Orthodoxy, which developed at the same time. This is the, um, the Calvinist side of it. Okay. Now, I have to give you a little background here first. A man named Jacob uh, Arminius. Um, hey. <laughs> sorry. Uh, hey. <laughs> Arminius was, he lived 1560 to 1609. He was a Dutch Calvinist pastor and scholar, professor. In fact, he was so Calvinist, he actually had studied in Geneva under Theodore Beza. Beza was Calvin's successor in the same way that Philip Melanchthon had been Luther's successor. So Arminius had studied in Geneva, where Luther had been, under Luther's successor, Beza, who was a Calvin? great... Uh, Calvin's successor, sorry. A great uh, Calvinist scholar. Now, because he was well known as a man of conscience and a man of a great scholar and a biblical scholar and everything, a church in Amsterdam, when he was a professor in Amsterdam, asked Arminius to refute the teachings of a man named Dirk Kuhnhert. Because Kuhnhert had written documents that questioned 
uh, Calvin's uh, doctrine of predestination. Now understand, nobody doubted predestination. In fact, Arminius didn't doubt predestination. But when Arminius started looking into what Kuhnhert had said about Calvin's doctrine of predestination, he concluded that contrary to the refuting it, which is what he'd been asked to do, he decided Kuhnhert had been right. And at that point, because he was a professor and anything he wrote was you know, fair game for debate and, and discussion, he started having debates with a, a guy named Romaris and others. It continued well after, after Arminius' death, in fact. And the question was not whether predestination was biblical, because there are many, many passages of Scripture that seem to clearly say that God in some way has foreordained. The question is... Uh, what predestination means and how it works. Important point. Mm -hmm. Arminius himself did not say that predestination wasn't correct. He said, I think we have a wrong idea of what that means. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, so Arminius, who otherwise was a strict Calvinist and remained a strict Calvinist, and absolutely was adamant about that, okay, he developed the view that God foreknew all who would believe in Christ. That predestination means two things. That he could look, God knowing all things could look into the future and see who is going to accept Jesus. <laughs> and that predestination constituted the act of God by providing Jesus Christ so that the elect could believe in him. Get that? When it says God chose, part of God's act in predestining certain people was to provide Jesus so that the people that he saw in the future would accept Jesus could do so. He provided the means by which they could be saved, and then just looked ahead and saw who was going to accept that. Right? That was Arminius's definition of predestination. Okay, I'm a strict Calvinist. I, I'm not going to be able to give you a better definition than that. Okay? Um, not a strict Calvinist. I'm not nearly a strict Calvinist. But that was how Arminius, who still said he believed in predestination, redefined it so that he felt he was still allowing a full scope of free will, and yet God was still all-powerful in this process. Okay? Bless you. So, in 1610, the Arminians, after Arminius' death, they issued a document, or a remonstrance, it was called, and later, because of that, they became known as the Remonstrance, T.S., um, a document which identified five key beliefs that they held mostly related to predestination. Um, and that became the basic Arminian document. Well, in response to that, the Dutch Calvinists, okay, you're messing with Calvinists in worship, you're messing with, messing with Dutch Calvinists, who are very hardcore on this stuff, they met as a synod in the town of Dort. So it was called the Synod of Dort. In other words, it was a committee meeting, a great big gathering. It was mostly Dutch, although they invited some members from Calvinist Reformed churches in other places. There were a few from England, you know, from German, Northern Germany, and a few other places, Switzerland. Mostly Dutch, though. They met in 16, uh, 18 and 19, end of 1618, start of 1619, and they developed their own five points in response to the document of remonstrance from the Armenians. Those five points became known as the five, as five-point Calvinism, or the TULIP Calvinism, T-U-L-I-P. That's an acronym for the five points. The five points of the, the Synod of Dort, or the, um, the Synod of Dort, that's called the Canons of Dort, the things they, they created. T stands for total depravity, that is, there is nothing good in you. It's not, there's not some, some piece of you that's good enough to be able to decide for God, and then God blesses that. Total depravity, unconditional election, those who are... Who are um, Deemed to be the elect, don't have a choice. They get elected whether they want to or not. It's unconditional. Third, limited atonement, that Christ died for those who would, who were the elect, not for everybody. Okay. Fourth, irresistible grace, that those whom Christ died to save will be saved. There's nothing they can do about it. And fifth, the perseverance of the saints, which basically means once saved, always saved. Now, I don't agree with all those. When I say Mr. Calvin, that's why I corrected myself. You know, there are pieces of that that, again, I think there's, there's points of interpretation in there. Well, that five-point Calvinism became the mark of what the Calvinist uh, theology was, of what Reformed theology was. Now, 
And I'm going to talk in a minute about what I think Calvin thinks about all that. Okay? Um, in fact, when the Synod of Dort issued these canons, they were so exuberant about enforcing this as the Calvinist belief in all of the countries where Calvinism was dominant, that they, they made ministers and elders and deacons and others sign documents agreeing to this. They even, they even went to organists in churches and made them sign this. And there's one organist that remarked that he did not know how to play the organ according to the canons of Dort. <laughs> but that's how, how emphatic they were about this. Okay, so this became, um, along with one other document, the canons of Dort became the formal and official doctrine of the Reformed faith at this point. Again, very entrenched, very rigid, very uh, unbending toward anybody who disagrees with it. And part of this was also in response to the fact that the Lutherans had done the same thing. Lutheranism, Reformed theology, which is Calvinism, were the two dominant Protestant bodies. Okay, the Anabaptists, everybody's still kicking them around, nobody really pays much attention to them, they didn't really have a Reformed theology so much. So these were the theologies. Well, let's keep going here about the Reformed theology, because it gets a little more complicated. The canons of Dort, as I say, became the strict orthodoxy of the Reformed faith in the Netherlands and other parts of the continent, as opposed to the Lutheran orthodoxy for the Lutherans. Now, after Dort, during the Puritan Revolution in England, which we have talked about, and I mentioned when, in the lecture on the Puritan Revolution in England, that they had what was called the Westminster Assembly. It was a group of what they called divines, which means uh, theological scholars and priests or ministers. You know, actually, they weren't priests because at that point the, the Puritans were pushing for there not to be priests. They were pastors. And pastors and others that were called together. They were all Calvinist scholars and theologians, and they were called together for the purpose of developing a theology and an ecclesiology. Ecclesiology is the theology of church. In other words, how do you do church? What's church about? Um, that would be more Calvinist and more Puritan than the Church of England. You remember in the Puritan Revolution, they were reacting against a number of things, but especially they wanted to take the Church of England, which was Calvinist in its theology, mostly, but Catholic in its worship and structure. They still had bishops, they still had priests, even though they could marry and all of that, uh, and the worship looked very Catholic, but the theology behind it was purportedly Calvinist. Well, the Puritans during the Puritan Revolution wanted to take it and make it much more Calvinist. Get rid of priests, get rid of bishops, have pastors, etc., etc. So the Westminster Assembly was called together in order to facilitate that, in order to come up with a plan that had theological support for moving in that direction, turning the Church of England into a much more Puritan uh, body. Okay? So the Westminster um, Assembly developed what was called the Westminster Confession of Faith, which still today is one of the primary Protestant confessions that exists. The, the Presbyterian Church, for instance, we have two, two books that are the foundation for really how we do church. One of them is called the Book of Order, which is the Book of Polity. It tells us you know, that we have elders and deacons and how they get elected and how you deal with problems and all that kind of stuff. The other one is the Book of Confessions. And there are, I think it's 11 now, 11 confessions starting with the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, the two oldest Christian confessions, and working our way up, and it includes one of the most important and largest is the Westminster Confession of Faith, which has a shorter and a longer catechism. A catechism is a tool by which you teach this stuff. And how many of you were Catholic originally? Okay, you went through catechism, right? And it, it's a question and answer thing. You learn, there's a question that gets asked, and the, the student learns an answer to it, and that's how you teach the theology. Well, the, the, for instance, the first question in the Westminster Shorter Catechism is, what is the chief end of man? Or the chief purpose of humanity, if you wish. And the answer is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And so you, you teach theology that way. Well, all of that was included in the Westminster uh, Confession. The Westminster Confession was much more detailed and extensive than the Synods of Dort, but theologically they basically, or the Canons of Dort, but basically they agreed with one another. Those two documents, the Canons of Dort and the Westminster Confession, reflected Reform or Calvinist theology throughout the entire of the 17th century and 18th century, so for 200 years after the Reformation. Um, and in doing so, they turned Calvin's theology, just like the Lutheran scholastics had Luther's theology, 
the, these documents and the people who held to them turned Calvin's theology into a very strict orthodoxy, rigid, dogmatic, unbending. This is the kind of thing that led the Presbyterian Church in Scotland at one point to, to what was called the fencing of the table, where they literally had strong men standing at the communion table, and anyone who was not considered to be either elect or righteous enough were physically prevented from taking communion. Okay? That was the kind of way in which these doctrines started getting interpreted. Okay? Now, both the Lutheran and Calvinist theologies focused on, again, what they believed their founders, Luther and Calvin, would have said. And in the process, both of them, I think everybody today looks at that, and said both Lutheran orthodoxy and Calvinist orthodoxy were far more dogmatic and unbending than Luther or Calvin ever were or ever intended to be. In fact, these two uh, theologies ended up driving wedges in between people. After going through the Thirty Years' War and all of the other problems leading up to this, most people were tired of this, tired of fighting over this stuff, even spilling blood over it. And now these guys come along, the Lutheran and, and Reformed theologians, and they develop these orthodoxies that are so rigid that they're going back in the wrong direction again, and people are fed up with that. And I don't think either Luther or Calvin intended that. In fact, I want to quote you, this is from... Uh, Justo Gonzalez is quoting this, uh, is saying this. Justo Gonzalez is another church historian who writes very, very well. You're familiar with him. Um, uh, I don't see Guillermo today, but he got his books in Spanish and really, really likes them too. Um, I want to read, read you something here. Um, the study of the Canons of Dort and of the Westminster Confession shows the nature of Calvinist orthodoxy in the 17th century and even into the 18th. While claiming to be a faithful interpreter of Calvin, intended to turn the theology of the Genevan reformer, that's Calvin, into a strict system that Calvin himself might have had trouble recognizing. <laughs> Calvin had discovered in his own life the liberating joy of justification by the unmerited grace of God. Now hear this. For him, the doctrine of predestination was a means of expressing that joy and the unmerited nature of salvation. In other words, for Calvin, saying that I was predestined to salvation is a way of saying, boy, I'm glad it's not up to me, and praise God that he did all the work. Mm -hmm. And so it was a joyful thing. It was a release to be able to believe that, instead of thinking I have to do something to earn it, even if that means just deciding it. But in the hands of his followers, it became a test of orthodoxy and even a divine favor, and even of divine favor. At times, they even seemed to confuse doubt regarding the doctrine of predestination with actual reprobation and consequent damnation. If you even question this, you're probably not elect and you're going to hell. Okay? In fact, one of the things the Lutherans did was they began to say there's no difference in a theological error and a heresy. A heresy is a significant error that probably means you miss the mark. An error could mean, okay, I believe in sprinkling and it turns out you really do need to dump. Alright? But the Lutherans would say there's no difference in error, in, in error and a heresy. Well, the Calvinists would say, if you even question our interpretation of things like predestination, then you're probably damned. It means you're not elect. There was little left of the humanist spirit of Calvin, a man who loved literature as an art and who wrote with the elegance and the care of a humanist. As a Calvinist, I am adamant that five-point Calvinism does not represent the intent or the theology of John Calvin. There I said it. <laughs> And yet, when I say I'm a Calvinist, I have people, oh, what? Okay, I was the only Protestant member of the, Catholic, of the board of the American Chesterton Society. They were all Catholics. Chesterton became a Catholic, did not like Calvin. But what he didn't like was Calvinism that came after Calvin. Not what Calvin said. Common mistake. So when I was introduced to the board by the founder of the Chesterton Society, he said, oh, guys, this is going to be interesting. Ross is a Protestant. And I went, oh, it's better than that. I'm a Calvinist. Okay? So. Is that what you call hyper-Calvinist? Exactly. Yeah. And that's a distinction some people have made. When it got to this point, they call it hyper-Calvinism. They've gone into hyperdrive in terms of their interpretation of it. And that's not what Calvin did. You know, in his institutes, the issue of predestination does not take a major portion of his writing. Oh, no, it's that was not an issue for you. It wasn't. It was just it was a very small part in the, in the two volumes. That the fact that most people think Calvinism is all about Presbyterianism, or it's all about predestination, is an example of the fact that they're looking at 
had hyper-Calvinism, not a Calvin. Calvin, that was not an issue. Calvin didn't feel like that was something he even needed to be argued about. Calvin and Luther and Zwingli all agreed on that. That was not an issue. Okay? In fact, all of the reformers agreed regarding this. Do you agree? Yes, absolutely. I'm not going to get into that right now, okay? <laughs> I, I, we'll spend the rest of the two hours talking about predestination. We've talked about it some before. And I'm not shutting it down because I don't want to talk about it, because I, can't, I don't want to talk about it here, okay? okay. Is there, was there something else? I was only going to ask one question sure. as an elect. Okay. Uh, can, can someone, Thank you for recognizing that, by the way. Can, can someone be believe that they have been saved and a member of the church and active in the church and not be elect? One, one of the, um, Calvin, in so many words, said, and this is actually reflected in the Second Helvetic Confession, which is part of the, of the Book of Confessions. It says, if one professes faith in Christ and believes oneself to be elect, you are elect. Okay? And it's not for anybody. Calvin made a point of saying it's not for anybody to question whether somebody else is one of the elect. But there, but there are people that are saved that don't know squat about election. Oh, they don't know election for yeah, me. I understand so, that. So that's not, that's yeah. not, that's yeah. not, that's not my This mind. is a theological issue, you know, a theological terminology. All right? But you get the idea. And the very fact that they have done this, that they have made orthodoxy, whether Lutheran or, or Calvinist, reformed, um, so rigid and dogmatic led to a lot of the other things we want to talk about. The growth of rationalism and pietism and some other things, all right? And again, I'm sorry for shutting you down, but we could start into the discussions of, you know, predestination, and that's not really part of the history thing. Okay, let's talk about the growth of rationalism. Can you guys see that all right, or do I need to pull it? Yeah, it's kind of blank. Well, the top. <laughs> Since the 13th century and the work of Albert the Great and Thomas Aquinas, Albert the Great was the, the teacher of Thomas Aquinas. It was Albert the Great that recognized the potential that Thomas Aquinas had. In fact, Aquinas apparently was a fairly large, kind of clumsy guy as a, as a young man and didn't say much in class. And they, they jokingly, one of the students one day said, oh, that dumb ox. And Albert the Great, to one of his students, said, let me tell you, friend, that dumb ox is going to shake the world. And he did. Aquinas is the theologian of the Catholic Church. Okay. Um, with Albert the Great and Thomas Aquinas, and there actually was a 12th century a, a renaissance. You know, we don't often talk about that. The renaissance usually we think about as being the 14th to 17th century. But there was a 12th century renaissance, a rebirth, which is what that means, of uh, scholarship in the Catholic scholasticism. So Albert the Great and Thomas Aquinas reintroduced Aristotelian philosophy as a tool for doing Christian theology. All right? And when you talk about Aristotelian theology, you need to understand that Aristotle was a, a philosopher and a scientist. It was Aristotle that created the first major scheme for, you know, we talk about uh, genus and family and all of that, you know, the structures of, of biology and, and all that kind of stuff. <coughs> Aristotle was one of the first ones to do that kind of stuff. So he was a scientist. He also happened to be the tutor of Alexander the Great. Did you know that, Aristotle? Um, which probably contributed to Aristotle, or to uh, Alexander the Great being great. Uh, so anyway, Aristotle was re sort of rediscovered, or at least reinserted into thinking by... Aquinas and his teacher, uh, Albert the Great, in the 13th century. And part of that involved the use of the mind, rationality, and the use of observation, looking at the world around us, and incorporating those two aspects <coughs> into theological consideration. Noticing the world around us, the created world, and using our mind to think about this stuff and recognizing the value of the rationality God has given us. And that seems obvious to us, but much of theology had not gone in that direction. They had done away with, with uh, philosophy, and they had done away with the idea of observation. They sort of locked themselves in little monk's cells and, you know, and, and hope for revelation. You know? Not that there's anything wrong with monks or revelation. Um, so by the time we get to the Renaissance of Europe, the main Renaissance in the 14th to 17th century, both of those things, rationalism, or rationality I should say, and uh, observation of the natural world had become major themes. This is one of the reasons why in the Renaissance, 
there's so much great art that comes out, you know, sculpture and painting and stuff, because observation led them to an appreciation of the human form and of, of the gifts of nature in a way that hadn't existed before the, uh, that they'd lost before the Renaissance, okay? Now, early in the 17th century, a man comes along named René Descartes, all those Frenchmen. Uh, Descartes was a philosopher mathematician. He loved geometry. He loved anything where he said it's mathematical in its orientation and that there are things you can determine beyond doubt, without question. So his goal was to try to create a philosophy that was similar to geometry in that it was based upon rationality and observation and it led to conclusions that were beyond doubt. Now, Descartes, like most of the people I'm going to talk, to, talk about, even though you wouldn't think so, was a man of faith. He actually saw this as a way of getting to a higher truth, a higher way of understanding uh, faith. So one of the things that Descartes did was he said, I want to lift reason and observation to these new heights. And this was called rationalism, the use of the mind as a primary tool. Early on, it wasn't considered the only tool. Later on, rationalism began to think that rationality in the human mind was the only thing that was valuable. Um, in terms of seeking truth. So, Descartes is seeking philosophical and religious truth, and he starts out by saying, okay, I need to boil this down to the lowest common denominator. And, all, and doubt everything. Let me reject everything, and start at the lowest point I can with something that cannot be doubted. And then build up from there. Because he was looking for certainty, like a mathematical certainty. Well, he boils everything else away, and he says, well... The only thing I can start out by saying for sure is the very fact that I'm asking these questions means I must exist. I can't be asking this question if I'm not here in some form. This is where he came up with one of the most famous philosophical statements in history, and that is, I think, therefore I am. If I wasn't here to think about this and ask this question, then I wouldn't exist. But the fact that I am thinking about it means I must exist. That was his first step. Okay, I think, therefore I am. Which, unfortunately, later on in, the, in philosophical history led to this huge object, uh, subjectivism, you know, that the nature of reality is based upon what I think. Okay. And that all really, although we didn't mean it that way, that goes back to, to Descartes and what's called the Cartesian philosophy. The Latin version of Descartes' name is Car Cartesius, and so Cartesian. In fact, geometry. You guys remember your geometry classes? What do you call that XY grid? <coughs> It's the Cartesian geometry. Cartesian geometry goes back to him. What verse is that in? Pedestrian. <laughs> okay, so so Descartes is developing this this idea, and, and his, his goal. He ultimately then came to an argument for the existence of God and other things. But he's focusing on human rationality and observation. Um, and from a philosophical point of view, that's huge. Next, in England, we have a man named John Locke, who, who develop, proposes and develops a, a system called empiricism. Now, if you've ever, how many of you all have studied the sciences? Science is based upon empirical analysis, meaning observing what is real, you know, the, you know seeing what is happening. So, empiricism meant that all knowledge is based upon experience, or is derived upon experience. That we don't start with any, you understand Platonic philosophy, oh, I wish I could teach you guys more philosophy. So we'll have a philosophical theology class at some point. There's going to be a class. Well, there's going to be a class in systematic theology. We'll, there will eventually, Why? in here, be a philosophical theology class. Okay? Uh, Plato, one of the founders of modern philosophy, because philosophy as we know it is a Greek invention, Plato had started with the idea that there were certain concepts that are inherent to us. They're called a priori. Certain things are in me before anything else. Before I learn anything, I'm born with them. Okay? A priori conceptions. Well, Locke comes along and denies that and says there aren't any a priori. You don't start out with any pre-programmed you know, software. That everything you have is based upon what you experience, what you perceive and experience. And so whether it's my, and he said there's three kinds of those observations. Observations of myself, what I know about me in terms of what I, how I think and what I, you know, what I feel, the stuff that's inside me, then the world around me, and then God. 
Lot also was a believer. Now, he had some ideas that we would say are not, not orthodox, or not rightfully, but these guys all professed to be believers in God, and they were looking for a better way to think about this. So, um, Locke said in empiricism that everything we know is based upon our reason processing that experience. We're going back to the human reason and the observation experience of the things around us, okay? Since faith, Locke said, is derived from revelation and not reason, faith provides a less reliable kind of knowledge. In fact, he went so far as to say that Christianity, he believed, was the most reasonable of all religions. He actually wrote a treatise called Christianity as the most reasonable of all religions. But he said there's nothing about Christianity that necessarily is, is unique that a proper use of observation, of empirical observation of the world around you and of the person's reason could bring you to the same conclusions about the nature of God. Now, obviously, Christians didn't like that. I don't like that. Because it denies the, the, the necessary presence of Jesus Christ, thinking that there is some other kind of natural uh, understanding that you can come to that is in itself sufficient. In fact, much of this is leading us toward this idea of a natural religion which we're going to talk about right now. And it is called deism. Um, deism, in the 17th century in England, partly as a rejection of the two options that we're having out there. On the one hand, there were all these squabbles over different religious beliefs, and the renewal of those squabbles caused by the rigid orthodoxies, and then the other alternative some people were beginning to turn to were, was atheism. Okay, I, this, what, the, what the religions have done is so bad, I'm not even going to have a religion anymore. I'm going to just deny the whole thing. Deism was an attempt to be modern and rational and find a natural kind of religion that everybody could buy into without either being, being pushed by these rigid orthodoxies, which were common in that day, or by rejecting religion all the way just denying it altogether. It was supposed to be kind of a middle ground, an effort to believe, not, not atheism, not the narrow dogmatism, but rather to find a religion that could be seen as natural to all humankind, based upon not revelation, this miraculous kind of understanding, nor historical events, which theism thought could be interpreted differently, but rather on the natural instincts of every person. What are the truths that everybody's going to agree with, that everybody has a feel for, was the idea behind deism. And so the emphasis, again, on human reason. The principles of deism, oh, I just did that, sorry. Um, the principles of deism included belief in the existence of God, and that was based upon evidence that there is a creator. <coughs> it's the sort of, you know, the watchmaker idea that... You see a watch and you know somewhere there's a watchmaker. You see the complexity of creation and there's got to be a creator. This didn't happen by accident. Most people, most people don't accept that anymore and I'm going, duh, you really aren't paying attention, are you? The complexity that exists in the world is such that the deists and a lot of other people looked at it and said, okay, there's got to be a creator. They also said that there then is an obligation to worship that God that made it that within that worship there must be certain ethical requirements. We need to act in certain ways and not act in certain other ways. And there is a need for us to repent when we do wrong things, and that ultimately in this life as well as in some future life, and we're not specific about that, there is both reward and punishment. The problem is that because they rejected all historical events, deism came to be, um, they didn't believe God was active in the world today. Okay, It's, it's sort of this... Uh, Deus Machina, God in the machine. Deus Ex Machina, that Machina, that God is in the machine. God created all this and then He left. He went on vacation in Puerto Vallarta. He's not. You he can't access. You can't call him. You know, He's not available. Uh, or else, some of us thought that God was simply an evolutionary force. There was no personality there you could talk to or relate to. So, Deism was a problem, and Christians responded to that problem by saying, "Look, if you reject all historical events and you reject all revelation." then de facto you necessarily have to reject Jesus Christ because he occurred in history and we have the revelation of the truth of that through the Holy Spirit. So Christianity and Deism were not compatible. 
And then, the most devastating blow to deism, and to all systems that were based upon reliance on human reason and experience or observation, was the coming of Hume. David Hume, uh, a Scottish philosopher who was sort of the father of radical skepticism, and one of my philosophical heroes. I can't agree with his conclusions anymore as a Christian, but Hume, Kant, and Hegel, two of them I'm going to talk about today, Hume and Kant, um, were my trinity for a lot of years as I looked at philosophy. Now, to this day, David Hume has never been effectively refuted by anybody. Okay? And I say that in advance of me talking about him. I also want to say, as I talk about David Hume, that <coughs> David Hume, you read the stuff he said and you think, boy, he must have been a sourpuss. Quite the contrary. David Hume was a apparently a lovely man. Everybody really liked him. He was bubbly and optimistic, and in fact, some historians, uh, philosophers of history, or historians of philosophy, it's funny because Hegel wrote a history of philosophy and a philosophy of history, two different books, both of which were like 2,000 pages each, I think. Uh, anyway, uh, Hume was so optimistic and so positive about everything that he had no fear of asking questions that might look like they were negative. He absolutely was sure it was all going to work out on the end, work out in the end. So he had no problem with being completely honest about this stuff. And he, because of that, he asked questions that again nobody has ever fully, nobody has ever successfully refuted the radical skepticism of David Hume. And you think radical skepticism again? He must have been a very negative person. Not at all. He was a very positive person and gave him the freedom to do this. All right. And he, like some of these others sort of bifurcated himself, he separated himself into what his intellectual activities and questions were, and how he actually lived his life. I mean, if you take David Hume's ideas, which I'm about to explain to you, to the extreme, you never get out of bed again, all right? Because what's the point? But Hume was not affected by that. He was still very positive, all right? So, David Hume. Hume, um, probably should turn the page. I'm going to tell you the same thing I just told you. 18th century philosopher, 1711 to 1776, um, Scottish philosopher, and Hume started out looking at Locke's empiricism and other rationalistic systems like deism. Deism said, for instance, we, we, we have to believe there's a God because we, look at, uh, we observe creation and our reason tells us there has to be a maker. So observation and reason again, right? I'm going to explain how all this affects Christianity in a minute, the history of Christianity. These really are huge things in terms of everybody who comes after this had to deal with this stuff, especially Hume and Kant, um, who didn't really disagree with each other. Kant just tried to explain what he believed Hume was right about. So Hume looked at Locke's empiricism, and he concluded that the problem is that the scope of true knowledge that Locke and others had talked about was far more limited than what they had proposed. In other words, he said, you don't know nearly as much as you think you know by observation. In fact, everything you think you know by observation is actually simply a product of mental habits that you've developed. You've developed a, a, a habit of thinking in certain ways, and you just keep feeding that. You're not really observing anything new. Particularly observe that while empiricism said the only true knowledge comes from experience, conclusions we draw are only mental habits created from past experiences. What we're used to seeing, we assume, is what's real now, and cannot be relied on as accurate representations of current reality. And let me give you an example of that. Who's reality? What's that? Who's reality? Yeah. Well, um, when we talk about the see, see, the assumption was there's a there is an objective reality out there, and that we all observe it. We have consistent understanding of it because of that. That's that's necessary to Locke's ideas and to others. Hume said, when we talk about cause and effect, for instance, one of the basic mechanisms by which the universe works. We're only describing what we happen to witness previously. We assume that what we witnessed previously is what we are witnessing now. With no assurance it's going to happen again or that it reflects a constant in the real world. And I'll give you the example that David Hume used. He said, okay, you're playing billiards. And you watch a billiard ball and it hits, you know, the cue ball hits another ball on a certain way and it goes in this direction. The first ball stops, the second ball has moved in a certain direction. You watch it do that a hundred times, or a hundred thousand times. Your assumption is that there is a cause and effect. The cue ball hits this ball, that's the cause. The effect is, it, go, it moved, the second ball moves in a certain direction based upon how it was hit. 
Hume said, I don't care if you've seen that happen a hundred thousand times. You don't know for a fact it's going to happen a hundred thousand and first time. You have developed a mental habit based upon what you previously have experienced. There is no rational or reasonable uh, insistence that it will always happen that way again. All right? And he's right. Nobody has ever refuted that. Now, the practicality, and David Hume would be the first one to say, well, the practical thing is you still have to live your life. You have to go through life and you have to expect to do these you know, certain things. So don't let this keep you from getting out of bed. But he also talked about the fact that our perception of substance is not reliable. I see this thing, and it's red, and I smell it, and I, you know, I look around, and the color, and the shape, and the size, and the odor, and everything else tells me that it's an apple. Well, I'm basing that on past experiences. I, that could be something completely different. And it just ha I happen to think it's an apple because of everything I've experienced before, which I have labeled as being the characteristics of an apple. But I can't, I don't know for a fact that it's not something completely different that just landed from Mars and just happens to cause me to think it's that, right? You see what I mean? Now that makes a difference because, for instance, the deists who said that they based their foundation of God's existence on what they witness in the created order, Hume said that's not really rational. You can't draw that kind of conclusion if you're realistic about what you, what you can perceive in the world and what your mind does with it. Notions like soul and God and eternity, Hume said, really don't have any meaning. Because there's no way for you to really develop, you know, to really be sure of those things. That's why it's called skepticism. You can't be sure. You're assuming all of this is an assumption based upon something that happened to you or that you experienced in the past. That doesn't necessarily mean it's true now. And anytime you start projecting that into long-term expectations about the nature of eternity or of God or of the soul, Hume says you don't actually have the, the right to do that, logically. Okay, now you're all depressed. <laughs> Did he apply that to everything? I mean, I yeah, mean, yeah. Although again, he was a he was a happy guy. Didn't you know, he applied it to all things intellectually. What's that? He didn't really apply it. No. He, yeah, he he he, he looked at all things and said all of human experience and rationality is affected by this. But then he got up from his desk and he went for a walk and had a, you know, had a hot dog in the corner stand and laughed with the children and had a great time in life. But, but this thing of 2 plus 2 is 4. No, it's not. You would say, what does that mean? That's completely the theoretical. That has nothing to do with experience. You have no experience of 2 and 2 plus being... You're getting into a different area there, which is, which is, uh, which is the theory of science. We assign numbers to things, and then say those numbers add up to certain other numbers. All that's a construct. All that's something people made up. That's not an objective reality. Okay. I'm not. This is not a philosophy class. So I want to tell you about another philosopher, though, that is is very important here, and that is Immanuel Kant. Again, one of my original trinity. This is before I was I was Christian. I thought I was going to stand on the shoulders of giants and see eternity. Immanuel Kant lived 1724 to 1804, a German, and is widely considered probably, I say perhaps here, but probably the greatest philosopher of all time. Kant read, he knew all the philosophy, you know, from, from the continent and from Great Britain. He read Locke, he knew all of that stuff. He read David Hume and his skepticism, and he said that Hume awakened him from his dogmatic slumber, <laughs> meaning Hume was right. I'd just gone along with this idea all the time like I was half asleep, not paying attention. And Hume has woken me up. So Kant then started dealing as a, as a great philosopher with this stuff and say, well, okay, how are we to understand this? And he decided that the way to understand it was to focus on the nature of the human mind first. He wrote a number of very significant books. The first of which, probably the most important, is The Critique of Pure Reason. Okay. And The Critique of Pure Reason Kant proposed, that, and again, remember empiricism says that you know you, you perceive things and that's how you learn, that's how you, your mind, your reason deals with experience. Well, Kant started saying, well, how does it deal with experience? What's going on here? And Hume is right that we're just making assumptions that what we experienced in the past is current for what we're experiencing now. 
So Kant looked at the human mind, and he said, I don't believe there's any such thing as innate ideas. He did away with the a priori ideas that, that Plato had, and that many other philosophers had built on. In fact, almost any philosophy, um, Western philosophy that you care to look at, is either based ultimately on Plato or on Aristotle. In fact, I have a class that I, that I teach because, called What's Wrong with the World, in which I, I delineate major philosophical thinkers down through history and who are identified as either, um, uh, either Platonic or Aristotelian in their focus. And what that means in terms of either being idealistic, meaning focused on ideas, which is Plato, or materialistic, focused on the material world, which is Aristotle. I'll do that sometime. But Kant said the mind is inherent, has inherent structures within it. And it's, it's almost like your mind comes equipped with cubby holes. And those cubby holes are uh, labeled time and space. Those are the two basic ones. That we exist in space and then we experience time. Those things are built into our perception and understanding. But there are others. He, in fact, he identified 12 other sort of substance categories that we have besides time and space. Among them are causality, existence, substance, etc. And everything we experience, every piece of data that we have come into our uh, experience, we place in one of those cubby holes. Cubby holes, my word, that's not Kant's word. Okay? But these, <laughs> these categories that the mind has built into it. Because apart from being able to categorize things in that way, Everything is, would be chaos. It would be this chaos of sensation. And when I when I read Kant the first time, I sort I thought about um, it, that without categories in the mind that sort this thing and keep track of it and organize it, it would be as though we were all autistic. Mm -hmm. You know what autism is? Mm -hmm. Autism. The reason why uh, severely autistic people shut themselves down, you know, they don't relate to the outside world, or if they're mildly autistic, they they become obsessed and fascinated with things like. We have an adopted nephew who is autistic. He's, he's functional, you know, but he's autistic. And he would turn the light switches on and off. Just stand and do that forever until somebody stopped him. Or he would turn the water faucet on and off. Okay? Because he's, he's unable, an autistic person is unable to differentiate. The reason severe autism shuts someone down is because there's too much information. Their sense input is chaotic because they do not have the ability to process it. Well, Kant was describing how it is that a mind is not suffering in that way, sorts this stuff out and processes it so that it's not just chaos, sort of the anti-autism kind of thing. Does that make sense? So, what we think is reality, Kant said, is actually not the way things are, but the way our mind is organizing them. Everything that comes in, we process. And what we understand to be reality is the is the post-processed stuff. There's no such thing as raw experience. Because by the time we're aware of it, our mind has already dealt with it. Okay. Therefore, purely objective knowledge, which is what Descartes, remember Descartes was going to boil it all down to the simplest thing and the one non, the one thing that could not be denied that was absolutely pure knowledge was where he was going to start. Well, Kant said, you can't get there from here. That's not possible. Everything is processed by the mind. There is no pure knowledge, no pure rationality. The Cartesians are wrong, the empiricists are wrong, the deists are wrong, all of that is an illusion. To that extent, he said he was right. Also, since it's no longer possible for us, we don't have categories to explain something like eternity, nor God. By nature, by definition, is greater than anything our mind can conceive. Therefore, it's illogical for us to try to claim some proof of concepts like God or the soul or eternity because the mind can't conceive of those things. Kant said it doesn't mean those things don't exist, it just means you cannot perceive them by reason. Because reason means the mind, and the mind does not have categories for that. Now, Kant also was a religious person. Again, some of, the, some of these, these folks... <laughs> were religious in a way that we would have trouble recognizing. But still, they were looking for ways to make this compatible with faith. And so Kant wrote another book. He wrote a bunch more books where he dealt with this issue, but the main one is Critique of Practical Reason. The first big book, Critique of Pure Reason, later he wrote Critique of Practical Reason, in which he argues, not very well, I don't think. I think this he gets a little weak here, 
He argues that in addition to the pure reason, which are the categories of the mind and how we process things, we have another kind of reason, which he called practical reason, which deals with the non-specific kind of data, like morals. Where do you put the stuff that don't fit into easy categories? He believed we had another kind of reason which dealt with things like God and morals and that kind of thing. Um, and it worked differently than pure reason. I think he just sort of, to me, critique of practical reason has always been kind of a footnote to cover his basis. Um, out of that, partly because of that, they developed a, a, a philosophy that supported deism and other things, which was called a philosophy of common sense, which sounds like something we'd all be in favor of, which <laughs> argued that that's all that really matters is our ability to do that. Who cares about the rest of this? All right? Except they were philosophical systems, and, and etc. Okay, we're going to take a break. I want to mention briefly, and I don't have notes on this, in France, they this rationalism, what's that? Nothing. We're making fun of you for not having notes. <laughs> Don't look. Sorry. Let me close in prayer. <laughs> Rationalism carried over to France, but at that time it, it became almost more a political issue than a religious issue. Some of the major figures were uh, a man named Francois Marie Arouet. Do you know who that was? No. Do you know him as Voltaire? Oh. Voltaire took in all of the philosophy that was going on at that time, and he was a man of great wit and humor, and, pes and yet was not, you know, he, he was not a, a strong believer. He read Locke. The only part of Locke that he related to in terms of the empiricism was Locke also did a lot of writing on political and religious tolerance. That part Voltaire really keyed into and began to really advocate religious tolerance, and, and that became a major theme of his. He also read Descartes' writing, and he said, interestingly enough, about Cartesianism, that it was like a good novel in which all is credible and nothing is true. <laughs> <laughs> he mocked the English deists for claiming to know about God and the soul um, more than is given human reason, uh, that human reason can know. In other words, he said, you guys are going way further than you've got any justification for in terms of thinking your human reason can get you there sort of what Hume said. Now, while he scoffed at all of those systems that were fashionable at that point, and he only took a little piece of, of locks, um, Voltaire focused on the human, because France at that time was a very oppressive kind of place, Voltaire took any sort of philosophical systems and he used them to, his, to, to advocate his and others' <coughs> idea about social justice and about the role of government. And he in the process, he was one of the writers that elevated reason, you know, the rationalism. And as a result, I'm sure he hates to think this, but Voltaire was one of the people that, that his writing and thinking and what he advocated led fairly directly to the French Revolution. Because the French Revolution did away with issues of faith and elevated reason, human reason. And the human, you know, the issue of, uh, of uh, fairness and, you know, equality, liberty, fraternity which was the cry of the French Revolution. All of them social justice kind of issues based upon human potential and human rationality. And the French Revolution greatly suppressed the church during that time. The church was pretty much done away with. Okay? Um, there, at that time, a guy you, you might be interested in studying sometime who was um, the Baron de Montesquieu. Montesquieu really created the model that we in America used for parliamentary government. He invented the idea of three branches of government that are that are checks and balances, executive, judiciary, and congressional, or parliamentary, and the idea that these three will control each other by, by having complementary powers, um, and a lot of other things that came, that later were used in English form of government actually, were adapted some of them, and then very directly were taken into uh, both American and I think Canadian, the idea of having, you know, branches of government that check and balance each other. Who was this again? Uh, his name was, his full name was Charles Louis de Secondat, the Baron de Montesquieu. Baron de Montesquieu, just look at Montesquieu. And then uh, somebody else you may have heard of who came along around the same time as Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau's big gig was that what everybody is calling human progress in light of the Industrial Revolution and development and theology and philosophy and everything, Rousseau said, all of this stuff that you say is progress is not. In fact, we're going in the wrong direction. It was from Rousseau that we got this idea of the noble savage. <laughs> that it, the closer you can get to the original state, meaning the, 
the, the sort of, um, you know, the Maori or the, the or Aborigine, actually the word Aborigine means the original you know, kind of uh, state, or the noble savage in America, the, the Native Americans, that that was the ideal state. And the further you got away from that, the worse off you were. And that anything that was done um, with regard to religion or dogma or institutions or anything else was actually damaging. To, so you can see how Rousseau's ideas contributed to all this because he advocated getting rid of all of that. That's what the, revolu the French Revolution tried to do. Okay. Um, all right. Now we get to one of the religious results of this was a movement called spiritualism. Do not mistake spiritualism with spiritism. Spiritism means believing in spirits. Spiritualism means believing in a more spiritual rather than dogmatic approach to our faith. Okay. Again, some, actually a lot of people, reacted against both the rigidness of orthodoxy and the spiritual shallowness of rationalism. It was just like trying to come up deism, trying to come up with a religion which is acceptable to my rationality, but doesn't have all the baggage of you know, biblical expectations of miracles and revelation and you know, all that kind of stuff. And so they were seeking some way for a more spiritual religious expression. There are a number of different spiritualist leaders um, some of which were kind of whack, you know, there were, there were a lot of apocalyptic kind of leaders in this, but the one that made the most impact, and that you probably may have, or you may have heard of, is George Fox, who lived 1624 to 1691. He was the founder of the Quaker movement, all right? Um, early in his life, George Fox, as a young man, was very inclined toward spiritual things. He had been a, interestingly, two of the, Beam, who was another one of the spiritualist leaders uh, early on, one of the ones that was kind of, kind of strange, both of them had been cobblers. They were apprenticed to cobblers. And Beam ended up being a cobbler. That's how he ended up living the whole rest of his life. Uh, Fox was an apprentice in a cobbler shop. And he was so offended by the licentiousness of the other apprentices that he decided, I can't do this anymore. So he took off. And as a very young man, is wandering around England, going to as many church services as he could. Most people go on vacation, they don't go to church. <laughs> he travels around and visits as many church services and religious events as he can, seeking illumination. Well, over a period of time, and, and during that time, I should say, he studied scripture constantly. In fact, to the extent that people who knew him said he knew the whole Bible by heart. He could quote from anywhere. So he was very grounded in scripture. Um, but the experience that he had of visiting churches all over England led him to believe that churches and pastors and liturgy, hymns, sermons, sacraments, all the structures that were part of the church actually hindered worship. Because he came to believe that true worship meant having oneself open to the Spirit of God. That that's, that's how you truly worship God, is being open to His Spirit. And all that other stuff got in the way. And so he advocated a kind of worship in which you didn't do all of that. You set all of that aside. Um, and in fact, uh, to the extent that he did not have sacraments. And the reason was because the sacraments, he thought, if you have physical elements, it detracts from the spiritual presence of God. So he's pretty radical in that regard. Um, Fox, when he began to develop these ideas, he would go to churches... And he would hear preachers say things, and he would stand up in the service and say, that's not right. Well, as a preacher, I can tell you that's not easy to hear. <laughs> and so he got thrown out of a lot of churches. He got beaten up by mobs. He got thrown in jail for being you know, a public nuisance. Um, he actually ended up... Um, in 1652, he married a woman named Margaret Fell, who was a, a gentlewoman. Oh, she was a widow. Um, he met her in 52. He married her uh, in 69, uh, many years later. But she became his partner you know, throughout all of this and a supporter. She was a woman of some means. Both of them, at various times, were put in jail for this, okay, uh, for, their, for their beliefs and for advocating them in the way that they did. Um, he eventually had enough followers, he organized them into a group, and the, his followers wanted to call themselves the Children of Light, because Fox talked about the fact that our, our goal is to seek the light of the Spirit in ourselves, to seek the light of God in ourselves. 
And so, because of that, the, his followers wanted to call themselves children of light, but he thought that sounded a little wrong. So he said, we're just friends. And so the church came to be known as the Friends. Now, the common name for them was Quakers, because these people were so intent on their religious experience that sometimes they would literally quake over the, you know, the, the spiritual enthusiasm that they felt. So they became known as Quakers. So many names, even Christian, for instance, started out as somebody else calling that as a derogatory name. Same thing with Quakers, and yet they accepted it. Okay? Um, the Quakers, their worship was silent. It still is today. If you go to a Quaker meeting, there is no plan. There is no order of service. You meet in silence, and people speak as they feel God leads them to speak or to pray or to offer a scripture or something of that sort. In fact, after uh, Fox began to develop something of a following, there were people who would be people who would come to his church because they wanted to hear him speak. And if he didn't feel led by God, he didn't say anything. And they went away quite frustrated by that because there was no program. Okay? I think it was because he didn't want to have to print the bulletins every week. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Well, he's a little um, quackle. What's that? He was a little wacko. Yeah. So he, um, this was the kind of service that they had. As I say, no sacraments for fear that would detract from the spiritual. They paid no tithes. They took no oaths. In this regard, they were like the Anabaptists. They practiced total tolerance and total equality. Men and women were completely equal. Um, his, wife, his wife was considered his equal in all of this. Women had equal right to speak or have roles in the church. Tolerance uh, meant complete religious tolerance. They didn't say you have to be like us. They said this is what God has led us to, and we think that this is the right way, but you do whatever you want. And in fact, the equality thing was not only between men and women, they considered equality between everyone. And that got them in trouble because this was a time when there was a very clear social order. And they would speak informally to people of, who were, by the world standards, in positions of authority. And it offended them. Okay, in those days, you would say you to an equal. You would say thou to, a, to a, somebody who's a servant or somebody who was subservient. Well, they called everybody that, including people who were in charge in society, you know, the governors and the mayors and the, you know, the policemen and all that. And they offended everybody. They refused to take their hat off to anyone. Not because of pride, quite the contrary, because they didn't think anybody was better than anybody else. They weren't better, the other person wasn't better. And that got them in trouble, okay? Well, Quakerism spread, again, because it offered a spiritual alternative to the other things that were happening in this time. Fox ended up traveling extensively, not only throughout England, but on the continent, and then eventually to the Caribbean, where a number of Quaker churches, and to the United States. In fact, there were several Quaker communities established in the United States, and William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania, was a Quaker. And, in fact, when, when Charles II, the King of England, granted the land grant, they owed, like, six, William Penn had, I don't know how he ended up being owed this, but the government of England owed William Penn 16,000 pounds, which is the equivalent of, like, 2.8 million pounds today. And so, because they didn't want to have to pay him the cash, they granted him all of what is now the state of Pennsylvania and Delaware, the largest land grant ever given to an individual in history. And William Penn took this land grant and set up the state of Pennsylvania as a, um, as a, a place where Quaker could be presented as a, or set up as a Quaker model. Now, the Quaker model meant there was complete religious tolerance. You didn't have to be a Quaker to be there. But the whole principle behind that state being set up, that's where I was born, by the way, was one based upon Quaker principles. And William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania, was a Quaker. He actually didn't want to call it Pennsylvania. When Charles II gave him that, the land grant, he called it Pennsylvania and they refused to change the name, and so Penn was stuck with it. Okay. He thought it sounded a little pretentious for, for a Quaker. Um, so, question. yes? Do they still call themselves Quakers? Yeah. Or do they, okay. Yeah. They, they frequently, you'll see the Society of Friends mm -hmm. uh, is what they often are called, but they're comfortable calling themselves Quakers now. That's shorthand. Yes? Yeah, I have had it the privilege of being able to speak in some Quaker churches, or well, one Quaker church, yep. I should say, and they actually support us monthly to be Good. here. But they, uh, they So they be quiet. A, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> uh, they actually do have a program at this particular congregation, and there is a, is a 
big difference from one congregation. Oh, sure. a, a real huge difference from one Quaker church to another. Some almost not even believing in God, to where others very uh, conservative, very uh, you know. That, that's true with a lot of denominations. Yes. But when, when I, whenever there is a, a denomination or a church that has such very strong and distinctive characteristics, like no oaths, no military service, no whatever it is, there's always a danger that that becomes their raison d'etre, that becomes their reason for being more than their faith. All right? That's just human nature. Well, at okay. present, their big thing is no war. No yeah. matter what They're, they're pacifists, yeah. Yeah, they're pacifists and anti-war. There's a French oh. university in Wichita, mm -hmm. and it's Quaker. Yeah. Do the teachers say anything? <laughs> Do the teachers say anything? I just don't even think so. I don't know. Uh, okay. Um, I want to talk about the next movement that came out of all this, and it is pietism. Another reaction against the rigidness of orthodoxy and the and or the spiritual shallowness of rationalism, a middle way between, you know, rationalism, which was ended up being predominantly atheistic, although deism and others tried to make it into a religion, and the rigidness of orthodoxy. Technically, pietism refers specifically to the German movement that was led by two men, Philip Jacob Spainer and August Ehrman Frank. Um, uh, Frank was the successor to Spainer. But this movement influenced a lot of others. So pietism really was broader than just what happened in Germany, and it including, including having a very strong influence on John Wesley and Methodism. So we'll talk about that in a second, okay? Let me tell you about pietism's development. Philip Jacob Spainer was born to an aristocratic Lutheran family in the Alsace. Alsace-Lorraine is an area in between uh, Germany and France, and in any given time in history, it's belonged to one or the other of them. Okay, and so the Alsace at this time was German. Uh, he studied theology growing up, became a pastor in Frankfurt, and while he was a pastor, he very much believed that there needed to be a greater knowledge by the lay people of what was in Scripture. And he created these Bible study groups, which he ended up calling Colleges of Piety. Piety, of course, means dedication to God. Um, and he, very, he picked up the Lutheran theme, since he was Lutheran, the Lutheran theme of the priesthood of all believers, which also is a Calvinist theme, by the way. The idea that it's, there's not this huge separation between priests who are special and lay people who just sort of go along for the ride. He believed in the priesthood of all believers and thought that the laity had a responsibility to focus more of their lives on devotion and study. Remember the other day, it wasn't this class, it was on the other classes, where I said, you know, one of the, one of the things that I try to do without maybe coming right out and saying it, is to, to let you all know that we, as Christians, we are theologians. Whether you like it or not, whether you want it or not, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a responsibility to be a theologian, meaning to learn what it is we believe, to learn the language associated with it, and to be able to articulate that. Okay? Well, that's exactly what Spainer was saying, is we have to devote ourselves to study of Scripture, to study of the things of God, and to be, in effect, lay ministers, all of us, now, his focus was more on spiritual growth than on doctrine, and that kind of got him in trouble with some of the other Lutherans. Um, because he dealt more with the experiential, uh, well, it's not true. Back, take that back. He, the, one of the accusations against the pietists was they were very experientially oriented, and that really wasn't true, especially early on. Spainer, while he believed we needed to grow in our piety, our personal relationship with God, he based it upon a very serious discipline of study and of devotion. So it wasn't, you, you weren't trying to just drum up some sort of feeling. There was, a, there was a discipline behind this. Okay, now, but that got into trouble with the Lutherans because of the focus on piety. You will remember Luther focused on justification far more and said very little about sanctification. Sanctification is the process of becoming more holy, of growing in piety. And so the strict Lutherans had a problem with this because that's not what Luther focused on. And they accused him of being a Calvinist, of course. Um, and there were some things that he learned from Calvinism, I think that's fair to say. But later on, Spainer began to focus uh, on, because of his study of Scripture, on Revelation, because he believed that a lot of the prophecies of Revelation were coming to pass. And it got a little weird. One of his followers and his eventual successor, August Hermann Frank, agreed with everything that, that uh, Spainer had said about piety and devotion and study, except he didn't agree 
uh, with Spainer having started to interpret all, all current events based upon the prophecies of Revelation. He didn't buy into that. So he took over and he sort of settled things down a little bit after Spainer. And he also tried to maintain a closer relationship with the Lutherans, uh, which they were a part of, uh, more so than what Spainer had. Um, at this point, thousands of people embraced piety. These colleges of piety, which were Bible studies, and this kind of was the foundation for modern Bible study, the idea of having own Bible studies. Pietism sort of was the source of that. In fact, pietism spread to Reformed churches as well, Calvinist churches. This idea, and there were people within the Calvinist churches that developed this idea of pietism. And to a very great extent, because it started with Calvinists in the United States, the Great Awakening, which I'm going to talk about in just a second, was a pretty much a direct result of the pietistic influence. Okay? Uh, of, of growing in piety and in commitment to the Lord. Now, in one particular way, uh, pietism made an impact on a man named Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf. Say that three times fast. <laughs> Who was, happened to be Spainer's godson, but he actually was a count. He, con he had control of uh, areas of land in Germany. He met and was very impressed with a group of Moravians who had been persecuted in Bohemia. Remember the persecution after John Huss and all of that? Uh, Moravia was next to Bohemia. They had left that area and were persecuted and exiled, and uh, Zinzendorf was impressed with them, and he gave them permission to, to live on his property, properties. He had landed estates. In fact, he was so impressed with them that eventually he left, left his position in the court of Dresden and joined their community full time and sort of became their leader. At one point along the way um, in this process, he ended up meeting a bunch of Eskimos. Uh, what happened was he, um, he met a group of Eskimos that had been converted to Christianity and were being sort of traipsed around Europe um, and meeting people. And the, he was struck by the idea that someone had gone there and presented the gospel. They believed it and they were now committed followers of Jesus Christ. He got so enthusiastic about this idea of going and taking the gospel to people. Now, understand, there was very little emphasis in the reformers and the immediate post-reformers on evangelism. This was a later idea. They were mostly concerned about surviving when the authorities didn't agree with you theologically and, you know, etc. Uh, and make, you know, going to other people who were Christians who had, they thought the wrong ideas and convincing them to change their mind. There was not this idea of mission. So Zinzen, Zinzendorf meets these Eskimos. He develops a passion for world mission. He takes it back to these Moravians. And in 1732, the Moravians sent their first missionaries to the Caribbean islands. Over the next number of years, these Moravians, which started out as a very small community, less than, at their height, like 200 people, they ended up sending missionaries all over the world. To Africa, to parts of Asia, the Caribbean, you name it, South America. In fact, they planted a number of mission communities in the United States. If you've ever heard of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, or Nazareth, Pennsylvania, or Salem, North Carolina, those are all Moravian communities that were planted as mission communities. In the, you know, in the colonies. This is before, you know, before everything. Eventually, the Moravians, although during his lifetime, Zinzendorf tried to maintain the relationship with the Lutherans, they developed enough theological differences and problems that after his death, they broke off from the Lutherans, formed their own church, the Moravian Brethren. And um, eventually, because they never were a very large church, when they were independent on their own, eventually they reached the place they couldn't continue sending and supporting all these missionaries. But the Moravians because of Zinzendorf's influence, and they were pietistic. I mean, they accepted pietism as being their spiritual orientation. They, um, this, this idea of personal relationship, of a spiritual connection with God and piety is what prompted them to want to share this with other people. Other people need this too. Now, um, but there was a major influence. Pietism influenced John Wesley and Methodism. In 1735, while a group of these Moravians were sailing to the United, well, to the colonies, to establish mission uh, stations there, they were on their way to sailing to Georgia, Savannah, Georgia. There was a group of them on board a ship. Along on that same ship, there happened to be a young Anglican priest by the name of John Wesley, who had been uh, 
invited to be a pastor in the colony of Georgia, which originally had been a penal colony, but we'll talk about that. Um, well, on board the ship, they run into a terrible storm, and uh, a ter terrible storm. The main mast is split. They think the ship is going to go down. All of the crew is terrified. Wesley is terrified. Wet his pants terrified. <laughs> the Moravians are singing. They're not afraid at all. And when they get through this storm, Wesley says to them, Okay, what is up with that? How, why weren't, weren't you scared? He speaks to one of the Moravians named Gottlieb Schwangenberg, and, and he, the, this man says to Wesley, we don't fear death. We know what's going to happen to us after death. Do you fear death? And in the conversation, uh, Wesley recorded this later. The conversation, uh, the Schwangenberg says, my brother, I must first ask you one or two questions. Have you the witness within you? Does the Spirit of God bear witness with your spirit that you are a child of God? And Wesley says, I was surprised and knew not what to answer. He was the son of an Anglican priest, and his mother, Susanna, was the daughter of an Anglican priest. Big church family. I observed it and asked, um, he observed it, he observed that, that Wesley wasn't sure what to say. And he asked, do you know Jesus Christ? I paused and said, I know he is the Savior of the world. True, replied he, but do you know he has saved you? I answered, I hope he has died to save me. He only added, do you know yourself? And I said, I do. As a postscript to that conversation, the young Anglican pastor commented, but I fear they were vain words. Wesley recognized he really didn't have the kind of faith that these Moravians had. Now, Wesley goes to his, his new position in Georgia, and it's a fiasco. It's a horrible experience. He does a terrible job. When he had been at Oxford, he and his brother Charles had been part of a group, a Bible study group, which, which ever, all the other people called the Holy Club. In fact, they, they called them the Holy Club because they covenanted together to, to study Scripture together three hours a day, and a lot of other disciplines. In fact, they said, you guys live your life so methodically. They started calling them Methodists. Later on, that word would be used for Wesley's program. Um, and Wesley goes to Georgia as a young Anglican priest, and he expects his congregation are all going to be like, like the Holy Club, you know. And he's, he's offended and appalled that they don't want to study the Bible three hours a day, that they don't, you know, that they're not like that. People aren't going to live like that. And he, he got himself in several ways, in trouble in a number of ways. He, for instance, got engaged to a young woman who broke off the engagement because she decided she fell in love with another man. Wesley decided that she was frivolous and unfaithful and refused to serve communion to her. <laughs> and finally he said, this isn't working, I better go back to England. And his whole congregation said, we think that's a good idea. <laughs> so he goes back to England. When he gets to England, he reconnects with some of the Moravians, and in fact ends up with a Moravian um, counselor and advisor from there named Peter Bowler, and um, who's helping him sort of work through his own uncertainties, etc. And he had an experience, uh, yeah, May, uh, actually it's May 24, 1738, Wesley writes this in his journal. In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldergate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. Now, there's a night on the town. <laughs> <laughs> About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. That experience, which to a great extent was led up to because of the Moravians' example of piety and faith, assured Wesley of his own salvation, and it prompted him to then want to do something to make sure other people were assured of their salvation. Now, he was an Anglican... Um, oh. Yeah, okay, let me just talk about that. He was an Anglican priest. He remained an Anglican priest throughout his life. He did not want to start a new church, but the Church of England was not ministering to large groups of people, and so he started doing that. Um, there was a period of time, I'm sure 
I must have copied it over or something. Uh, he ended up in England continuing as, a, as an Anglican priest, and he wanted to minister to more people. There was a man named George um, Whitefield. Whitefield was a preacher who split his time between preaching in Georgia, that's where he had met him, and in England. He had been part of the Holy Club at Oxford, and he now had become a famous preacher. Well, he invited John Wesley to join him in his mission work in England, particularly so that John could take it over when he was traveling back every year. He would go back part of the year to Georgia to preach. Whitefield was a fire and brimstone preacher. He was famous for this. He preached outside. Wesley was a fairly conservative, almost mousy Anglican priest at first. He didn't like the idea of preaching outside. In fact, he says later on in his journals, there was a part of me that wondered if maybe it was better just to leave people alone than to preach outside. <laughs> Later on, he caught on to it. In fact, he became famous for that. And one of the, one of the stories is that a, a, an Anglican later on said, you know, why do you, you'll preach outside in the rain and thousands of people will come and stand in the rain to hear you preach. Why is that? When there are perfectly good cathedrals they can be going to. And Wesley said, well, I've discovered that if you set yourself on fire, a lot of people want to come and watch you burn. <laughs> <laughs> so Wesley began to develop this movement. He, he as more and more followers, again, he refused. And whenever one of his followers suggested that they break off from the Church of England, he would chastise them. He, um, but he had enough followers. He organized them into classes, small groups, into... Um, Circuits, later on, Methodists would be circuit riders, which meant they would go from multiple point charge, multiple churches, they would go horseback from one to the other. Okay? And um, then that was collected together in the, into societies, and then the large grouping was the connection. He had to have a structure because it became so big. Um, he started ministry in the United States after the, the, revolution, the American Revolution, most of the Church of England ministers came back to the U.S., or back to England, I'm sorry, and so he had to come up with somebody to fill in, and he instituted the lay preachers, which he didn't want to do for a long time. His mother actually convinced him to listen to a lay preacher that he was about to suppress, and he was so impressed, he said, okay, yeah, well, this can work. The church in the United States actually broke off first and formed the Methodist Church in America before they broke off from the Church of England in England. It wasn't until after Wesley's death that they actually became their own church. And, and it was very Calvinist in theology with one exception, and that is it was Arminian in its view of predestination. And it is still today. I have a friend who's a, she's a, a Methodist minister. She's actually a superintendent in this Methodist church now. And she was going to a Presbyterian seminary and decided she couldn't accept, accept Calvin in that regard, and so she went to a Methodist seminary and became a Methodist minister, but God forgave her for that. <laughs> okay. I want to speak for a few minutes now on Christ very quickly on Christianity in America. The dominance that initially was enjoyed by Portugal and Spain in the Americas diminished in the 17th century, 1600s, because France and Great Britain both established a presence in North America, most notably the British 13 colonies and the French presence in what we now know of as Quebec. There's a reason they speak French in Quebec. Okay? Because um, previously the Americas were entirely controlled by, by Spain and France. Now the, the Spanish, I'm just right, Spain and, and Portugal. The Spanish were established in Florida. The oldest city in, in North America is what? St. Augustine. Or Augustine if you're actually a theologian. Uh, St. Augustine, which was Spanish. Well, part of what the British were trying to do was to keep the Spanish from moving north. And so various of the colonies, especially Georgia, some of the ones on the south end, were specifically oriented toward trying to keep the Spanish from moving northward and taking over the rest of North America. Um, most people think of the United States as being founded by, by people who fled Europe for religious persecution and they came here to a land where there was complete total freedom. It's not true. Many of the Puritans and others who came to the United States were more oppressive than the people they left. In fact, Uniquely, Rhode Island, which was founded by Roger Williams in 1631, it started out as a Baptist. Uh, a Bap in fact, he, he started out as something else, and then he he baptized a congregant, had them baptize him, and they became Baptists. Okay, they maintained religious tolerance, and Williams was kind of strange and ended up um, going in weird directions. Anyway, but he founded Rhode Island with the idea that they would have religious freedom and tolerance there, partly because he couldn't decide what he wanted. 
<laughs> then Pennsylvania, as I mentioned earlier, was founded by William Penn on a Quaker model, which inherent to that was the idea of religious tolerance. That's part of the Quaker idea. Other colonies, generally, with a couple of exceptions, Maryland was formed, was founded, I'm going to mention that in a minute, by Lord Baltimore. It was given as a land grant to Lord Baltimore, who was Catholic, and it was like, like a Catholic alternative in Maryland to the rest of the Protestant colonies. But because it was Catholic, but there were a lot of Protestants, and in that day they were trying to get as many people to move there as they could, because you needed people in order to, to, stay, to create a uh, you know, place where people would live. Um, then they had religious tolerance there, uh, and a couple of others. But for the most part, the Puritans and other groups that left Europe got to, got to uh, the, the colonies, and they set up communities that were just as intolerant as the places they had left, only in the other direction. Uh, it'd be nice if we could say, oh, it was all sweet and some light, but it simply wasn't. Now, while some of the people that fled the, um, to the New World from the Old World, from Europe, came for religious freedom, again, people think they all came here for religious freedom. For the most part, that's not true either. Most of them came here to make money. They came here because of economic opportunities. Organizations like the Massachusetts Bay Company and the Virginia Company, etc., came here and they were funded, sponsored by those that wanted to make money. And very quickly, whereas the Spanish, and to some extent the Portuguese, when they had conquered uh, Central America and South America, they discovered all this gold and silver and everything. You know, all these galleons going down in the Caribbean full of gold and all that. Well, there wasn't any of that. And there also wasn't, the other thing that the Spanish and the Portuguese benefited from in South America was a labor force. Well, in, in North America, the problem was the, the natives, the, the Indians were not settled in cities and things like they were in the Mayan Empire and Incan Empire, etc. They were very mobile, and if somebody started trying to oppress them, for the most part, they just went into the woods. You didn't have a workforce that you could control. And so they decided that the only way that they were going to make money here was by agriculture, because they did have very fertile land, and particularly they discovered they could grow tobacco. And so, there was a lot of emphasis on growing tobacco, especially in the first of the English colonies, which was Virginia. And because tobacco is very labor intensive, it takes a lot of work, they started importing slaves. That's why slavery started in the United States. There was very little, almost no emphasis, with rare exceptions, on evangelizing uh, or being missionary to either the Native Americans or to the slaves. In fact, to a great extent, when slaves were brought into the country, the idea was that we don't want them to become Christians for one of two reasons. Because there was an ancient prohibition to having other Christians as slaves, so the best way to keep them out of the problem with that is don't let your slaves become Christians. <laughs> or the other problem that they had with it um, was the idea that if we, if we teach them enough for them to be Christians, they might get uppity and we'll have more problems with them. Better keep them ignorant. And, you know, that was just the way it was. But this idea that people came here all for religious freedom and then they were all, you know, tolerant is simply not accurate. Um, Georgia, interestingly enough, was intended particularly to be a border against the Spanish movements northward and as a penal colony. Britain has a, had, a, had for a long time, there had been constant appeals to Parliament to do something about the prisons, especially because even somebody who was put in prison for life debt, okay, the prisons were horrible, you know, the people weren't fed, there was sickness, it was unsanitary. They were constantly complaining about that. They finally decided, all right, let's at least do something for the people who are in there for, for minor crimes like that. And so they developed the idea. Oglethorpe was a general, and he developed the idea. That's why there's Oglethorpe, no Georgia. Um, to use, to form Georgia into a colony that would both protect, southern protect from the Spanish, and also be a place where you could send uh, people northward who, uh, or I'm sorry, could send people from the horrible English prisons who were not major criminals. All right, now, having said that, uh, the, I printed the same thing twice. What do I have? Yeah, twice. Okay. It's the same thing. I must have copied something over. Come on. Uh, let me go back to that. Now, the various other colonies, there were places like the, um, you know, the, Pilgrims, the Mayflower colony, they came primarily for economic reasons as well, but they did have a desire to establish a Puritan presence here. There were others who came wanting to establish the Church of England here, but in fairly short order, primarily because they needed people to come, 
they want they needed to be as have as little restriction as they could. After a while, they figured out, look, if we tell people they can only come here if they're, you know, Reformed Puritans, or if they're only Baptists, or if they're only Catholic, people, we got a lot less chance of getting people to come here. So they began to open it up, and that's why we have this sense that the, you know, the colonies were a place of religious tolerance, because for economic reasons, they eventually had to be. They didn't start out that way. Um, Virginia was the first of the colonies that was established, and uh, the Sir William Raleigh, who was a favorite of Elizabeth I, founded Virginia. He was given a land grant to found Virginia, and he named it Virginia because Elizabeth was called the Virgin Queen. And apparently she didn't have a problem with that because, you know, Virginia was named for Virgin Queen, and it was an honor to her. Right? She never married. She never had children. And so Virginia was established. The first two efforts to have colonies there failed in the 1500s. The first one, the people gave up and sailed back to England. The second one disappeared. You've heard of the Lost Colony? They still don't know what happened to it. Okay? I could tell you stories about Melungeons and all kinds of things. They don't know if they were you know, captured by Indians or driven off or there was disease or whatever. They left behind some really weird kind of clues. Uh, a carving on a tree that said Aratoa, which is the name of an island off of the Carolinas. But there wasn't anybody there. So, uh, fascinating stuff. There's actually a play in, uh, in North Carolina called um, Lost Colony. And uh, so they kept trying, and they finally got a group of people there. The first, the early efforts to colonize were quite horrendous. The uh, pilgrims, the Mayflower pilgrims, when they landed, they landed with 101 people. That first winter, a plague swept through, and only 50 people were left alive. They lost more than half their people the first winter. And then the Indians come along and helped them. Even though the Indians frequently, efforts were made to enslave them, they were, you know, not evangelized. They were seen as less than human by most of the uh, most of the people who traveled there. But because the Indians helped, the Mayflower community survived and were able to grow from there. I got to stop. We're out of time. Any questions about that? All right. Thank you all very much.